Hey everyone, my name is Matan Hazanov. I'm the Managing Director of Verstra Ventures, an early stage VC based in Toronto, mainly focusing on investing in B2B software businesses. I'm looking to highlight some exceptional entrepreneurs uh, that have succeeded despite adversity. And today I'm speaking with Michael Millar, the founder and CEO of Verto. Uh, I first met Michael in February 2020, uh, a few weeks before COVID was declared a global pandemic. Um, we closed our first investment in June 2020 at the peak of government-related uh, COVID restrictions and uncertainty regarding the pandemic, as well as the absolute chaos uh, that existed at that time in the healthcare industry. Michael is running and building a healthcare software startup. So hearing his perspective on how we manage this crisis and how we, despite what was going on in healthcare, managed to significantly uh, grow his business. And um, I think it will benefit entrepreneurs, business leaders, and everyone that's curious how to build a successful startup to hear Michael's story. Uh, Michael, I believe, um, well, let's start off with some background on you, your career, what led to the creation of Verto, and of course, what Verto does. So let's go, start. Okay, go uh, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, so um, I started my journey, I, was a I graduated as a computer scientist from the University of Alberta, and I was always, I really was like the original nerd. I, I believe that technology could solve some of the biggest problems that, that society faced. And uh, I chose, the, I decided to work in healthcare, uh, which kind of brought me to Toronto. Um, so I came to Toronto. I've been passionate about working in digital health for so long. And I worked in healthcare for around about 15 years. And as I worked in startups and hospitals and in the healthcare system, even in the Ministry of Health, I was just like, every time I thought that there was a better way to solve the problem, I just didn't find a group that was looking at it in the right way. And yet the, the healthcare has tons of problems, right? Interoperability, access to care, and um, basically what that brought me to was the fact that, you know, the, the reason why healthcare was having trouble working together was because it was pretty fragmented and they didn't have a common language to talk to each other. Uh, and so the inspiration was, is there a way that we can make it so that, you know, everyone is talking about health. How do we make it so that the data and their systems can talk the same language? And that's what brought me to the idea of bringing digital twin technology to healthcare. So it's it's pretty interesting because the first time I spoke with you, I was kind of floored about uh, how healthcare is done in Ontario. I mean, I'm only a consumer of healthcare in Ontario and in Canada broadly, and I was shocked to learn how, um, at least on the digital side of things, you know, if I go from one institution to another, my information is not getting passed along. And if it is, it's usually because I'm demanding it, not because, <laughs> the, you know, the different providers are speaking to one another. Um, and as a, as a consumer, I think that's normal, but clearly it's not supposed to be, right? Yeah, and, you know, you have to understand the history of how healthcare formed. It's not like there was a grand design and everyone started working together. It was very organic, right? Home care wasn't a formal type of care. It was just people helping people at home, and then it got formalized, it got paid. And so each one of these systems created data structures, policies, and technologies independent in their own kind of categories, not really thinking that in the future, uh, effective care would actually rely on the entire system. And so it's understandable, but because it is uh, a single payer system, because it is public, um, it doesn't have the normal market forces that would consolidate that data, right? And so other industries, like if you think about logistics, um, it naturally consolidated, right? And so the people were able to acquire, um, whereas in, in Canada, those systems still are largely independent with their independent technologies and data. So have you been in healthcare your, your whole life, essentially? Uh, my my professional life, professional life definitely. Yeah. As a child, I wasn't thinking about it. But, <laughs> right, right, of course. Yeah, but um, I, you know, for me, I always wanted to work in an industry where if I worked really hard, that I knew that I was improving the world. Like, that's one thing. Like, when I start working at something, I kind of go heads down and I focus like crazy. And I didn't want to be in an industry where when I look up, I wasn't happy with what I created. And so to me, healthcare seemed like one of those areas I could work really hard in and it would create benefit for people around me. Right. And for you, that's actually, a, I think, genuine, you know, there's kind of the Silicon Valley meme where everyone's creating this 
abstract and crazy technology. And then they, you know, their tagline is to make the world a better place. You actually <laughs> believe that. So that's, it's very refreshing. <laughs> you know, working with you for a few years, I think that's actually true. Um, so before Virto, what were you doing in healthcare? Yeah. So uh, it's funny. Right before Virto, I actually wasn't in healthcare. I was actually uh, working as a AVP in business intelligence in the banking sector. But it was intentional. Um, I actually worked in healthcare for every job, every position before that. And the position right before that was the e-health strategy lead for the Ontario government. And the reason why I moved into banking is because I wanted to really understand how other industries manage data. Like I, I wanted to go into an industry where data was everything. And, and to, in banking, data is everything, right? All you have is bits and bytes are your account balance, but they make an entire business model off of that. So I wanted to understand how they governed, how they managed that risk and the complexity. And um, I learned a lot. And I think that it also gave me the freedom to do some initial test cases of my own business model for the healthcare idea that I had uh, without doing conflict of interest with my daytime job. So if you were to describe the problem Virto is solving in as simple terms as possible, because it took me a while to get it myself, but uh, especially for people in internet land, you know, (laughs) how would you describe the problem that Virto is solving? Yeah. So uh, yeah, recently I came up with the, the easiest way to describe it. And it's just understanding how healthcare has evolved. Before, when you had healthcare, you'd talk to one or two physicians, and that was the extent of the treatment. But now if you undergo cancer care, you're talking to a team of around about 20 more or more physicians and clinicians as they go through. And so as the number of people who are involved in treating these complex diseases and, and conditions increase, the need for them to share data and share it effectively becomes higher and higher. And, and actually... We're now at the point where a, a single individual physician isn't usually the responsible, responsible for a bad outcome. It's usually a drop in between them. And so what our technology does is we try normalizing the language and the way that data is exchanged between them so that it's not a handoff, but it's just about subscribing this care team to that personal information as you go through so that we can alert them with the most important information that affects your, your outcome uh, real time. And so by making sure that entire care team can operate more closely to the data and to any updates that are relevant to them, it makes people healthier, it's cheaper for the health system to operate, and that's what they call population health management, and that's basically what our technology helps do. So so what I understand a digital twin, which is kind of the underlying concept of what you do, is you're taking all the data that's floating around in different hospital systems and physician offices and whatever, and you're abstracting that and saying, okay, we know, let's say, obviously, with cons- patient consent and all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, we're protecting everyone's privacy, yeah. don't worry about it. But uh, you're, you're, you can know, essentially, the entire healthcare journey of a particular patient. Yeah. So that within uh, the hospital or the healthcare network, um, that information is understood by everyone that needs to understand it. Why is that such a challenge today? Or before Verter got involved, why is it such a challenge <laughs> Well, uh, so the term that they use in in healthcare is interoperability. So what they want is to have records that are interoperable with each other. But what you need to understand about healthcare is as it gets more complex, it's complex not because people are doing different things in sequence. They're actually managing different aspects of your care. So someone might be managing uh, the genetic impacts on on a treatment. Someone might be managing radiation therapy, uh, chemical therapy, medications. So they all have different responsibilities, but it's all for the same care journey. Um, That means that they care about different data sets and they store different data sets in each one of their systems. And so if you can think about it, if if your job is to deliver chemotherapy, you want to have a tool that is optimized for delivering that. But if you look at that same data, maybe a little, little parts of it are very important for how a person treats you afterwards for, or how they change surgery. But how do you take those small bits out and make sure that you share it with the next person? That's why we wanted to create a digital twin, something that could absorb all of this type of data inside one location and then only provide the data that's relevant to each person when they need it the most. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's a lot of bold claims in terms of, you know, improving patient care and all that. I would think, I think when I think about patient care, I think getting the right doctor, a competent person to provide care at the right, the right time. Um, how is getting... Because the data is going to reach that doctor eventually, I hope. Yeah. I also have bigger problems, of course. <laughs> uh, 
how is getting it, let's say, quicker or easier, really, you know, changing the the math on patient care, making it cheaper, more efficient? Like maybe walk us through an example. Yeah. So um, let, let's take um, a, a cancer care example, right? If um, the, the way that people first detect that they have cancer is either they go to their primary care doctor or they do a routine screening. And based on that result, maybe there's something suspicious and then they get handed over to a diagnostic clinic. So in that one phrase, I made it seem pretty simple, but you need to get the actual image from the place that you took it as a screening in its most accurate form to the diagnostic clinic. If you're missing certain aspects of that data, if the report wasn't clear, if the timing wasn't clear, that creates delays in the process. Now, the whole point of doing screening is to catch cancer before it has a chance to form in a big way. So cancer is one of those ones where the clock starts from day one. Um, so when you're able to remove a week because you got all the records to them on the first referral, and then once you do the biopsy, you're able to get all the pathology information to the entire circle of care within the same day. That's how our system creates a better process is by attacking each one of those transitions where a simple data mess up, a mess up could delay surgery, delay chemotherapy, delay radiation. We attack those transition and care points. Mm -hmm. And so uh, really what we want to do is create certainty in the process. But the other thing that the technology does is as you're going through that journey, if we discover something new, so let's say that as they do surgery, they realize that there was two sites that were there. That information gets back to everyone on the team faster. And so not only do we streamline the most common use cases, but we also help uh, clinicians streamline the care around exceptions and things that are different in a patient's care so that um, there's fewer things that are dropped during each process. Fascinating. So this is the question I ask basically every startup that comes to us looking for funding. And it's, <laughs> what did you figure out that somebody else didn't? Because clearly if there's a big problem being solved, a lot of value being created, there's probably thousands of people trying to solve it. What did you figure out that allowed you to actually solve this problem? Because you have a great traction, which I can't share with everyone, you know, unless you sign an NDA or something. Or, um, but what did you figure out? Uh, yeah, and uh, I advocate you. I remember you asking me that question. Uh, and the way that I phrase it is you shouldn't start a business with a, some unfair advantage. You need to know something that not everyone else knows. And there was two things at the technology level that I kind of understood. The first one was that normalization of data across healthcare allows for the streamlining of data information. And so there was um, uh, there was a normalization standard called HL7 Fire, and I just jumped on board and I said, the digital twin will be in this language. And so by creating that rule, now no matter how many data systems that I ingest data from, we're always talking apples to apples, right? The second problem that we solved in an unfair way was that I knew that a health system on average had between 100, like 120 or more data feeds that I had to manage uh, that were live. And so, so like in a particular hospital or something or? Yeah, that's a single hospital. A single hospital, they have like an inter this engine that connects data and sends it between all the systems. They probably have 120 feeds or more that they're managing, right? And uh -huh. so if you don't have some way of automating the process of, the, of those feeds, it's going to kill your ability to grow and, and consume larger and larger environments. So if a hospital is running 120, then a health system is running hundreds and thousands of these feeds at one time. And so what we decided is that we wanted to create an automated AI-driven approach of consuming data from these feeds. And that would not only let us rapidly ingest the data, so we have faster turnaround times and go lives, but also let us use AI to manage the data quality as we went forward. Mm -hmm. How did you happen upon this uh, solution? <laughs> like, what did you do? What, what was your what was your aha moment or the catalyst that led to? Because I've heard of H, H. What is it called? Uh, the fire. H. Seven fire. Yeah, yeah, the fire protocol. I, I remember doing a deep dive on that when we uh, were doing diligence on the business. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's how did how did this not? How was this the first time or one of the first times that healthcare data is being normalized across like a. <laughs> a state or a province or something. It, it was mind boggling to me, but okay. So, so that came about, but what was the catalyst for you? Yeah. The catalyst for me was, I was actually, um, I actually side hustled the company from 2009 to 2017 and everyone will call that. Um, I, I call it side hustling, but it actually was rapid POCs, right? 
And so the whole goal there was to actually integrate with a bunch of different EMRs, so that uh, electronic medical records, um, so that I could understand how they transfer data. And every time I went to implement this for a cancer solution that we were deploying, um, every one of the hospitals said it'll take me six to nine months before they could set me up with an integrator. And I was too impatient for that. So I said, just send me the feed. I'll figure out the data. And so they would send me the raw feed with no specifications, no documentation. And I was able to figure out what was in the feed just by looking at thousands of messages. And so what I did was I created a pattern or a playbook that I did that. And I realized, wait, I could get AI to do this. And that was the aha moment when I realized that the approach that we had for understanding and finding key data um, didn't need to have human intervention in order to be automated. And that's really what changed the approach that we had to do these large scale integrations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. It's a, a classic case. And this doesn't, it's not always successful when people do this. You were a professional services provider, a side hustle. You had a side hustle business while doing your banking job or eHealth Ontario project or whatever. And you turned that into a successful software business raise money from people like us, obviously. And yeah. uh, today, I mean, you're growing pretty rapidly, so it's pretty exciting. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, COVID and how the business managed during that time. Because we met, again, in the intro, we met uh, in February. Yeah. And that's when we started effectively started diligence on the business. We were very, we, I, I loved it when I heard about it. But uh, I mean, my, my earliest memories of starting to learn about what was going on and how the virus was spreading was like out of a zombie apocalypse movie. You know, when they, they show <laughs> like uh, the, the broadcast, oh, an infection is spread and, and, you know, going down the, the elevator of my condo, seeing the news reports and, <laughs> and like this digital advertisement block, just seeing the headlines, virus spreads, you know? Um, I didn't make anything of it really for until it was declared a pandemic in like March 15th or whatever, whenever that happened. Um, when did you first see COVID as a significant problem? that would affect the healthcare industry in, in, a, in a material way? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I first became aware of COVID, I think it was in late 2019, um, in the news. Uh, and there was a company called Blue Dot that was um, able to find its Toronto base, so it was really cool. But Unrelated to the Blue Dot company we invested in, which is an entirely different industry. Oh, uh, okay. Based in Toronto. <laughs> <That's fair. laughs> uh, but um, they... Um, it became real for us. I think it was beginning of uh, end of January, actually. Uh, one of the reasons why is we're, we I have a chief medical officer. We we always are grounded in reality around the science of healthcare, and uh, I had the privilege of being able to just step over and just ask a question, and it was serious at that time. And the the, the there are certain details that just made it inevitable that it was going to spread at that time. And for everyone in the digital health industry, there's this big event that happens every year called the HIMSS conference. And it was funny because um, everyone was looking to that saying, are they going to cancel it? Are they going to cancel it? And that was kind of the litmus test. And when they canceled it, that's when I was like, oh, this is going to change everything about how we sell and what we do in this business. Um, yeah, that was, it was a conference that seemed too big to be canceled at last moment. And it what got, dates were, oh, I forgot. Were those held on? It was, End of February, I believe, if I'm correct. Uh, I don't recollect completely, but I remember looking at that. And when they canceled that, I was like, oh, man, this is this is serious. Yeah, it's interesting because that same, uh, I think we met at U of T Entrepreneurship Week, yeah. right, which is like early yeah. February. Um, and I remember it was like a three or four day event. It like takes place over the course of a week. And I remember everything was normal on the first day of the event. And they had pitches and all that stuff. And then the next day, like, listen, guys, we have to shut this down. We're getting like, <laughs> I remember that that was uh, that that kind of seared into my memory. That was like the first time that um, our life was impacted by people reacting to to what was going on. Yeah. That was pretty fascinating. Um, so okay, so you you this event was canceled ultimately. Yeah. So what was your first decision as a as a business leader as someone in the healthcare industry? Yeah. So uh, at that time, we're selling this complex, large data solution that requires probably a six to 12 month implementation, very hands-on in the hospital. And suddenly all the deals that we had in our pipeline, all the kind of contracts that we had working on that, 
there was a, a very acute difference in how people were reacting. The virtual care programs, so we were supporting one that was going live. It's this awesome after hours uh, program uh, that's run throughout, can- uh, throughout Ontario for people going through chemotherapy called Care Chart. And they, they were, we were accelerating work because it was a virtual care program. But anything that was on premise, suddenly it was slow, it was hard to get them phone calls. And that's when it became very real to me that my pipeline was going to change. It wasn't going to drop out, but it was going to change in a big way. And that was my first indicator that we need to do something different. Uh, my second indicator was when we realized that their spread is that we we had to adopt hybrid and have, in fact, encouraged people to stay at home for the safety of everyone. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. So, I mean, when I, because we were doing an investment in the company at this time, we're, doing, we're effectively doing diligence, right? I, I remember myself you know, spending time at home, I was working from home and just gave me a lot more because I didn't have to commute to work, which is like an hour each way, which thank God I don't have to do every day anymore. Uh Um, But I remember having more time to do diligence on Virto, more so than most other businesses because I had less distractions, no events to go to, basically no commute. (laughs) And uh, Virto was basically on the top of my list of companies to to diligence at the time. So uh, I remember going, doing a deep dive on Virto at the time. And that question definitely came up for us is, okay, well, healthcare institutions are not going to care about implementing new software, right? Like they're trying to figure out how to manage a spike in, you know, people going to the emergency room, for example, right? Yeah. So what was your reaction to customers now shifting their focus almost entirely? Now, of course, you said that the pipeline will shift, but that's not obvious. The pipeline should have gone down to zero because nobody wants to spend time implementing, you know, some software. Yeah, it, at that moment, I had enough experience to realize that there were, uh, you know, in healthcare, they call them, there's elective procedures and then there's mandatory procedures. And I knew that the electives would definitely slow down, but electives uh, aren't things that you don't do forever. They just mean that they're elective right now. If you don't do an elective procedure, sometimes they create major procedures later on. So like I a knee need, surgery is an elective procedure. You need it, but it can wait a week. Yeah, thing, exactly, right? right? But I mean, like, if you don't get some some of those corrective surgeries, then then you need it because now you lose mobility in the future. And so um, I, I knew one of the things that I that's a little bit different. I'm a technical founder, but I obsess about healthcare processes and policies. And so to me, I know generally what are the types of procedures that are done in a healthcare system. What are the things that they need to do in person or in in a, a overnight stay? What requires an overnight stay or just day uh, uh, an outpatient therapy? And so what I realized was they still needed to do this work. And I also knew the state of the technology in the hospitals, and I knew that they were not prepared to do this type of work in a fully virtual model. Um, and so one of the things I did realize this pretty early was that the data integration component would lose its importance and the ability to coordinate hybrid workflows would become more important. That was my, my hunch. <laughs> I, I, I just had to, um, and part of it is you just need to, when your pipeline falls out, you need to be able to look at it, assess it and say, if this is falling out, what are humans doing? Because what, what will the people who are working in healthcare, it's not like in a pandemic that there's going to be, no work for healthcare. It's like healthcare is pretty important during a pandemic. Um, And so what we, and and the other thing is we had great relationships with the existing clients. So we were able to talk to them, ask some questions. And we noticed that they were quickly deploying Zoom or Teams or these kind of solutions out there to do virtual conferencing, even though they weren't approved or anything like that, just because they had to get the job done, right? And so... um, I started listening to the clients more, trying to see their behavior that they were doing. And that was very important for us to do at the very beginning. Because by listening to the people that we already talked to, we could understand their problems. And then we could say, how do we, what's our role in that problem space? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you taking your workforce from in-person in the office to hybrid. That was one of the first things you did. What else did you do? Like, let me give us some some examples like what did you do as a business leader in your business to mitigate the impacts aside from the sales stuff which we'll get to and that ties into your product and how you shifted product focus at least in the short term 
uh, one of the things, what, what the diligence we did on the product stuff was interesting because uh, that allowed us to do the investment despite all the uncertainty. But, you know, as a CEO and founder of this startup, you're raising money at the time too, which I'm going to ask you about. Because <laughs> uh, we weren't the only people at the table. There were two other institutional VCs yeah, that yeah. participated. Um, so what did you do? Like, aside from the hybrid stuff, what yeah. else did you do? Yeah, the first thing is, uh, the first thing I thought about was, um, how it would impact how we did work in the employees in our company, right? Um, um, I do feel a sense of responsibility for them. And so just putting our, uh, our, our, uh, ourselves in their position, we realized some of our, our employees were parents. And so really what we realized is let's follow the, the Ontario guidelines for what they do. And we made a rule to our company that the moment that they shut down schools, that's when we would start becoming a full remote company. And so to, you know, one of the things that, uh, I, so I always talked and I asked questions to my, our chief medical officer, Mike L. Anderson, and um, it got guidance from him. And then as we got guidance, we would do full team meetings every morning just to inform people what was going on. And then we would tell people what we were planning on doing. So if we, the moment we decided that once schools were shut down, that we would then become fully remote. We we actually communicated that I think two weeks before it actually happened. And so when it happened, people just knew what to do. And so I think uh, one of the things that was very important is that the executive met, we talked through scenarios and then we shared the scenarios with our team. So when the scenarios happened, no one actually panicked or it didn't cause uh, a lot of disturbance for our company. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about fundraising. Uh, because that must have been a fun time for you. You know, raising money is is quite difficult. Uh, I've I've tried it myself, and you've done it very successfully. So you're in the process. Uh, the term sheet was already signed by the time you know March fifteenth. There was already term sheet was already signed some some time before that. How did your narrative or focus change at all, if at all, uh, in raising capital? Like, you know, February was one story, I imagine, and. After that, it was different or slightly different. I don't know. You, you, you tell me in the audience. I know how I can speak only for myself and my experience, but I know that there are other investors. So I'm curious to hear from from your perspective what changed in terms of your approach to fundraising. Uh, yeah, and I, I actually think the reason why I was able to close the round was less to do with what I did after the pandemic, but more to do with what I did before the pandemic in the game, which was I didn't come to them saying here's one solution, here's a market opportunity, and you can invest in it. Because if you make it all about the product or the, the current traction, then the moment where something existential challenges that, your entire angle falls apart. My angle, and you can tell me if I was right on this, uh, my angle was more of, I know where healthcare is going. I have experience, I've spent time in this industry, I know that this is where we need to go initially. And the interesting thing is what I was saying in 2019 was that we needed to move to larger models of orchestrated care. Like we need to do population health. We need to do value-based medicine. But I did focus on orchestration as one of the key components. And um, orchestration in a pre-pandemic model was all about making sure that the process was tight. But in a post, in, in, a, in a pandemic situation, what it now it still has value in the fact that it lets you now incorporate virtual and non-virtual uh, in-person activities in a streamlined workflow. And that's what a lot of the hospitals found, which is they had to examine every single procedure that they did, see what things that they had to do in person and only do those and everything else find a virtual way to do it. And so I, I think I was able to articulate some of that. I think we called it smart waiting rooms at the time. So like you could come up, you could wait in your car, and then we'd use SMS to call you into the clinic when you needed it. Uh, ultimately, that's not what we deployed, but the instinct was that there was a need for these hybrid type of orchestrations. And when I was able to change the dialogue from being specifically around ca uh, like uh, care pathways into this more virtual hybrid orchestration, uh, it demonstrated confidence for a few people that I could keep the plot even in a changing environment. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can share a couple of the products you deployed right away or not right away, but uh, after the pandemic became, you know, official pandemic and government instituted its restrictions. Uh, so what were the first couple of products? Yeah. So um, uh, when the pandemic hit, 
the pipeline did disappear. So <laughs> other than <laughs> other than the the initial project that we were doing for a virtual program um, with, with with Care Chart, um, most of the other contracts slowed down or or, or went away. Um, but one of the first ones that we did deploy was the virtual kind of the virtual check in and support um, for programs at um, Unity Health Toronto that used to be St. Mike's. Um, and so we were working with ambulatory programs and we, we started targeting specific programs like um, their pediatric clinic or clinics that didn't want to have people waiting in the waiting rooms. And we created a way for them to pre-book their appointments or else do virtual waiting queues. And so uh, that was very important because we we're able to work with an existing partner to change the model to be able to help support this new hybrid model of care. Um, so that was the first kind of change that we did. But then when we realized that this hybrid orchestration was was capable, um, we started realizing that we could take it to more complex procedures. And one of the very in-demand procedures was how do you use this kind of orchestration for COVID testing automation? And so that's when we started talking with uh, some people at Deloitte and some other companies. And uh, ultimately, we met the team that was responsible for doing the COVID testing pilot at uh, at the, uh, the Pearson Airport. And uh, we were able to deploy our technology to fully automate the, the first kind of traveler study on doing COVID testing for people entering the company, uh, the country, um, because before that they weren't actually letting people come into the country of, uh, for for normal travel, and so um, the, our orchestration technology was able to do a test at the airport, automatically send a courier to their house a week later, and then a courier to their house two weeks later, to demonstrate that we could contain and actually control testing and exposure in, uh, while managing the quarantine rules. And so that was very exciting. Uh, that project was an insane timeline. I think that we were tapped three weeks before go live. And we were able to reconfigure our program to deploy it at scale uh, to deploy that solution. Yeah, it's interesting because I think the fact that you're able to deploy that quickly is a testament to the dynamic nature of your your platform, right? Because if if I'm a, like in the VC, VC line, if someone tells me I'm going to deploy a virtual rating room, that's not very exciting, right? <laughs> you know, despite the fact that, you know, it's surprising hospitals don't already have something like that in place, <laughs> but we'll leave that. That's more maybe a problem yeah. with uh, healthcare here <laughs> than it is a testament to what can get funding in startup land. But that's not exciting in and of its own to, to deploy a virtual rating room, right? It's the fact that you're, at least as far as I understand, your platform is dynamic enough that you can spin up a product like that very quickly while enabling all the data to transfer between all the relevant parties, the patient, the institution, the government, et cetera, right? So maybe you can just go into a little bit of that. How are you able to design the product in such a way that, hey, you, you can just deploy, you know, this at scale, a program with Air Canada, the, the Pearson Airport, the government of Ontario, I assume, the federal government in such a way that it makes all the ha parties happy making sure there's patient consent and all the stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so maybe uh, some people would be interested to how you've kind of designed this thing uh, that allows you to do that. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And it actually comes back to the, uh, the, first, the first differentiator, which is a concept of normalization, right? Um, and, and I'll be honest, like until we started doing these rapid deployment models in the pandemic, I didn't even understand how valuable that differentiator was. Um, by, by us creating a normalized data set and saying this is the data no matter how it is, we remove all the question making around what's the right data, data capture, how do we, where do we store it, how do we exchange that data. None of that, all those conversations kind of disappear a bit because our goal is whatever data you can provide, we're going to store it in this model. And so uh, whenever we do an integration, we're not only bringing in the data that we need for that one business case, we're bringing in as much data as we possibly can. So when we do a test, we're bringing up as much data, we're bringing in targets, we're bringing in specifics about the, the, the level of, of COVID positivity. Even though we didn't use that in the traveler study, we actually brought that into the digital twin. And by being greedy about the, the data, that means that you can now support the next process because the data that you have in the digital twin probably is more than the data that they need to do the next step. And so what that lets us do is just go to everyone, say, 
when they say how much data you need, we just say all of it every single time. And because of that, when we go to the next step of the automation, of the orchestration, we're never caught without that data. And so that lets us now talk with six different people, bring all the data together, and always have the data that they need for the next step. Um, but that philosophy led to agility during the pandemic. That's, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty amazing. I think that's one of the reasons why we felt comfortable investing despite all the, all the chaos uh, was that we we saw so many applications of this platform, right? We saw, hey, you can kind of, once it's there, once it's embedded, once you're collecting the information and normalizing the data, it's actually um, the possibilities, I won't say are endless because nothing's endless, but <laughs> <laughs> but there there's so many opportunities. I mean, we've talked about, I don't know if it's a bit dystopian or hopeful, you know, where you can look at an entire population of, like on, in Ontario and determine, hey, there's, you know, between the ages of 55 and 65, there's X amount of men with high blood pressure that haven't gotten a checkup in the last 10 years. Let's reach out to them and make sure they have a checkup. Now, again, patient consent. We're not saying that we're collecting information un unfairly or anything like that. But that was one of those kind of aha, aha moments I had, which is like a lot of people aren't very good at managing their own health, right? And if we can predict, hey, there's a certain group of people that would benefit from an intervention because we have all this information and we can train the data on all this information, uh, that can lead to much better health outcomes, right? Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, we use a, a guiding principle in our company uh, called the quintuple aim, which basically says um, that in order to provide, you know, sustainable value for healthcare, you need to lower costs, <laughs> obviously, uh, but improve patient outcomes. But you need to do that while thinking about the patient experience, the provider experience, and understanding equity and how that plays into it as well. And so one of the things is that um, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because, you know, no person wants to be bombarded with you must do your health care this way or being told how they need to manage their health care. But um, that's we built that ideology into our actual technology. So, you know, if we do identify the 55 to 65 year old males who aren't doing any type of checkup or management of their blood pressure, then maybe the most, I don't know, compassionate way to notify is not to reach out to them directly, but just let their physician know, just let their physician know, Hey, we kind of expected to see some type of uh, blood test done in this period, but we don't see anything. Maybe remind them at your next visit. And the way that we send that message is through the tool that the physician already uses. These are the ways that we believe in. This is what we built into our orchestration platform to allow it to do so that instead of it being the Orwellian kind of reach out and the commandment that comes out, it's more of a, a subtle nudge into people to encourage them to move inside the right direction. That was a good way to answer that, I think, uh, <laughs> because that that's always something that, uh, that's why I use the word dystopian, because it's something that worries me is, you know, giving maybe get government too much information about us, even if it benefits us sometimes, sometimes the value of privacy is much greater than, you know, the benevolent government coming to save us, right? So that that's a great way to, to approach that is saying, hey, let's first start with, um, you know, consent of patients, but also making sure that if there is an intervention, we're not bombarding the the, the person with that. We're saying we're going to their actual healthcare provider and saying, hey, maybe um, next time you see them, you, yeah. you kind of make them aware of that. Uh, that that's kind of a great way to approach it, I think. Um, have you faced any kind of uh, pushback on how you're collecting information? How do you deal with the data and make sure people's privacy is is um, safe and kept secure? Yeah, so um, there's two patents that we, we filed. The first one was the AI ingestion patent. The second one was a data virtualization patent. Okay, so what, what does that mean? Uh, data virtualization, um, to understand healthcare and privacy rules in Canada, uh, the patient actually owns the information. They use this term healthcare information custodian. So a physician that you meet, like your family doctor, is only a custodian of your information. They, so they, you are trusting them with their, that information. Um, our, our second patent understands that. So every time we get data from a single provider, we actually store it logically separated. It doesn't get mixed with all the other data. And so we're able to connect all these different streams. So as I talk, thousands of streams of data come in. Each one of them is logically separated in our platform. And only 
when the the person has been that uh, when the person consents to the, that physician or that group being part of the circle of care, do we actually merge the two data sets together to provide better, better care? And so by we built that into the architecture since the day one. And that philosophy has been strong throughout our organization. And it's allow us, allowed us to step inside areas that are usually too hard for people to step into. So uh, something people don't think about is, um, you know, you've got the healthcare system, but where do you draw the line? Do you, do you consider a, a paramedic part of the healthcare system? Do you consider a, a at-home caregiver? How about, a st- uh, how about a relative from overseas? Like, where do you draw the line? Who's a healthcare professional and who isn't? Because healthcare is designed to share data between healthcare professionals, but it really doesn't know how to share with these people that aren't designated specifically as healthcare professionals. And so that's where we use consent. We're like, you know, we remember the ultimate owner is the patient themselves. So if a patient says, share this data with this person, then there's actually nothing in any other privacy legislation that says you can't share that data with that person. And so our system supports that capability, which lets us reach into new models of care uh, pretty effectively. That's that's great. Um, pivoting back to the COVID stuff, do you consider yourself to have pivoted the business? Because <laughs> I'll tell you from in, in VC land, pivots are always a red flag. If a company <laughs> pivots, not, not always a bad thing, but it's certainly a red flag that one has to dig deeper into. Um, it usually means product market fit wasn't found or... You know, that probably is what it means <laughs> most of the time. What would you say uh, about that? Would you consider yourself to have pivoted during this time? Yeah, that's an interesting. <laughs> uh, the funny thing is that you've kind of answered it uh, in some of the questions and the statements you made before. One of the things that you liked about the technology was that it could solve many different problems, right? So, um, but at the same time, if we try solving all those problems, we have no focus. How do you grow? How do you scale anything if you're doing everything right? And so um, what, what I didn't pivot was what we do. We, we, we kept on building an or- a digital twin that was capable of doing system-level orchestration. What we did pivot on is what we communicated what we did to the market because we understood that the market was shifting. So I would say that we pivoted our sales motion and our sales organization to focus on the needs that we knew that pandemic would drive. Um, But we kept our eye on the prize about moving the core technology forward. Um, And, and, uh, you know, definitely if you're an entrepreneur in Canada, you have many vehicles to help fund and develop and push forward R and D that aren't only clients paying for your solution. And so we kept our eye on the prize, but we also understood that we needed to serve a market that existed during the pandemic. And so uh, to answer, I'm not trying to dodge the question. I will say that we pivoted because the way that we serviced, the way that we had to focus development and what we had to do required a lot of changes in the company, but we didn't pivot from our core vision. And so I, I think it's important that uh, people understand that pivots cause a lot of turmoil in companies as well, right? They cause confusion. It can learn to churn in, empl- in employees and staff. Um, but what we did is we pivoted what we sold. And the interesting thing is here standing in 2023, I can say that now we've pivoted back to our original uh, mission and what we wanted to do with our technology. But once again. So, so let's dig into that a little bit. You, you said you've pivoted your sales organization. That's one of the primary uh, pivots. Can you, can you walk us through that? What did that entail and how did you do that effectively? Yeah, so um, selling into Canada shouldn't be your five-year strategy if you're a digital health startup. Inevitably, the type of growth that one expects with a VC-backed company probably doesn't match the the, the market adoption curve that you would have in a Canadian market alone. So most digital health companies should have some strategy to move inside uh, a Commonwealth equivalent market or the U.S. market in order for them to to, uh, to be VC backable. Um, that was our goal in 2019 was to become a VC back company. And what I realized was that uh, we weren't able to sell into Canada and we weren't able to sell into the U.S. 
So um, normally I wouldn't have looked for growth uh, domestically as much as I had to, but I had no choice. You can't get on an airplane and sell to the U.S. Um, so as, but the interesting thing that happened is that the pandemic also shortened the sales cycle. There's, you know, you whenever you're doing a sales, uh, trying to qualify a sale, you're looking for access to power, budget, and motivation, right? And the nice thing, the the pandemic was horrible. It was like there was so much uncertainty, but it created a lot of motivation. And so uh, what we realized is what are people being motivated for? What are the budgets that they're allowed to allocate in order to address these problems? And what are the problems that they're supposed to solve with those? And what we did was really look at our customers, who we sell to, figured out how they were thinking in terms of what they were allowed to move forward with, and then put our solution, put the part of our solution that could solve those problems in front of them. And we did that pretty quickly. I think within two to three months, our, our messaging was all around hybrid and virtual care orchestration at that point. Okay. So there's, there's I hear two things that we discussed so far. One is that your software was designed at the outset to enable different types of products on top of it, right? Yeah. So virtual care being one, digital twin, all, all that interesting stuff. Once you notice that the demand, so to speak, is shifting in a different direction, you basically just adopted your sales strategy to fit that demand, which seems very rational, uh, which is, I guess, those two things can't, usually they would have to go together, right? You'd have to have a product that can you can sell, right? Yeah. And that is de in demand. Uh, I guess one of the reasons a lot of companies fail in pivots is because their product isn't designed to fit the new demand. If, or they get it, or they get it wrong. They get the demand wrong. I guess your insight is that you got the demand right because you've been in this for for quite a, quite a number of years. Which I guess for any burgeoning VCs out there, um, invest in people that know their markets pretty well. That's <laughs> that's kind of important. People just out of university typically uh, don't have that kind of experience, but you get lucky once in a while. Yeah. You know, um, that's why actually most VC backed companies are people that have had a decade plus experience in some industry. You know. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's that's the way it is. Um, okay, so what did you do practically in the business to actually shift your sales strategy? So obviously you create new materials. Did you hire new salespeople or did you, like, did you walk us through? What did you actually do practically? Yeah, we actually did hire, uh, the first thing that we wanted to do was make sure that there's product market fit in this new reality, right? And so the great thing is we had existing relationships with the types of ideal customers that we wanted to have in our portfolio and we had trusted strategic partnerships, and they knew we understood what that meant. Uh, in the past, when they needed something changed, we were accommodating and we were flexible. Because of that, we had a dialogue. And so they would come to us and tell us what the reality was. They would tell them what their problems were. And, um, you know, I've mentioned the COVID testing, but that actually wasn't what drove a lot of our business during the pandemic. The, the real solution that drove a lot of our growth during the pandemic was our ability to do um, prioritized vaccine appointments. And the group that we worked with was the team at Unity Health Toronto who came to us and they said, here's a crazy problem. We need to somehow find everyone who's above 85 years old in our jurisdiction and make sure that they're vaccinated before we give any vaccines to anyone else. And when you're in a strategic partnership like that, where they feel like they can come with that problem, you have to understand that that's a, you you have to take it seriously. And uh, uh, again, we were fortunate. Again, the the product was flexible. And so, uh, from the point where they asked us a question uh, till five days later, we were able to deploy a vaccine, a prioritized vaccine booking link that they were able to send out to every nursing home, and the nursing homes were able to self register. And so suddenly, they went from having to run a 30-person call center who is phoning these nursing homes saying, do you have 85-year-olds? To sending out a link and having these people automatically booked. Um, and um, the, that's when we knew that we had something. So you put when, the call center out of business is what you're saying? I did, I did. But the call center was staffed by like C-suite people and VPs and directors, right? Oh my gosh. But I mean, like this is, you know, let me, the two things I want to say about that, that's why I love working in healthcare. Like during the pandemic, People threw away their badges and they just did whatever they needed to do. And, but what people didn't understand is like, you know, when you when you let a VP start doing their job again because they don't have to phone nursing home after nursing home after nursing home, um, it, it means that you were there when they needed it. And that that's a long kind of trust that you can actually build on. And so that's kind of how we rolled it out. Like, because 
uh, everyone doesn't know this, but hospitals had a hard burden on them. They had a responsibility, and public health units had the same burden to, you know, and this was, in, remember when the vaccine just came out and everyone was trying to get that first shot, the people that you need to give it to are the people who are going to be most negatively affected by COVID infection, right? And so I actually think Canada did that well, and that's a large attribution to those hospitals. But we we love the fact that we, were, as a digital health company, we were able to do something of substance, uh, and we're just happy that our technology was able to pivot into that domain really quickly. And it worked, unlike some of the other uh, providers <laughs> by certain government entities that uh, rolled out their own stuff, which we're not going to mention here because uh, we don't want to be too controversial. But um, let's. I think it's important for people to understand. The growth that you had during this period was crazy. I've been in VC for a number of years. We almost never see this kind of growth for a business. And usually when it happens, it's usually it's short-lived, especially when the demand is from some external force that's kind of impacting you externally rather than some something from the ground up. Um, I'm not going to give specific numbers, but I think it's important for people to know the company grew by several hundred percent. And we're not... St- we're not starting at like a base of like a thousand dollars, you know. <laughs> We're starting at a very high base number, and then the company was several hundred percent from there in a, in a couple of year period, um, and that's that's crazy. Even by by venture standards, when you're dealing with high numbers, that that's pretty significant. It almost never happens in the, in the rare cases where you have a, uh, an amazing business that does happen. But um, it was pretty amazing to see that kind of growth. Now, one of the challenges we talked about at, at the board, right, was how do you ensure that the, the companies and the customers that are now using your product stay with you when, you know, COVID is no longer an issue, the COVID restrictions are no longer an issue. And that I think is also very important, not just getting the customers, but retaining them after the crisis has abated. So what were your strategies there? Yeah. So it was a twofold strategy. Um, what we had to realize was, you know, this was unusual. It was unusual for Canadian healthcare to uh, award contracts as quickly, to actually mobilize. We had health systems that signed on the contingency that we would be up in two days, right? So, I mean, that has never been said in a healthcare procurement uh, prior to 2020. Um, but what the the harder part of it was to, you know, you want to, you get caught up in the rush. It's adrenaline because, we're like our the team was so amazing. I have to say, my team was so phenomenal. Like we were deploying, uh, like every project manager I think was deploying six different clients at the same mm-hmm. time, staying up until eleven. And you know, we just as executive, we're just like, what can we do to support this? What can we do to motivate it? But the in that hype, you you then think that that's everything that you have to do. But then we just looked at the reality of it. We just knew that you know we're deploying vaccines. Their job is to reduce the the occurrence of of COVID. And so if we do our job successfully, we will not have this same job in two years. And so we had to effectively look at, we looked at how each client used us. If they only used us for COVID booking, we represented that as one-time revenue. And if they started using us for other services, that's when we started saying maybe they're a more longstanding client that we can serve. And so, um, you know, having that discipline uh, I, I credit my executive team to be able to keep us on track, but um, you hire staff against reoccurring revenue. You don't hire it against one-time revenue. And we were able to keep our eye on the prize, and that's what uh, helped us because ultimately a lot of that revenue did drop off, and there's nothing that we could do to retain it. Yeah, that, that's pretty fascinating. So, number one, you created a dynamic platform. Two, you you kept close to your customers, which is very important. But in terms of the pivot, it sounds like you're getting the feedback from your customers directly in terms of what their demand was. And then you basically offered that to them. And the way you were able to retain them um, is maintaining that kind of close relationship. Now, now, obviously, you know, one of the good things about working with you is that you've set, you, you kind of set the bar very high, but very realistic as well, which is, you know, the, all the people we invest in are like that, but it's still very rare in startup, in the startup <laughs> land. Um, so that was pretty amazing that you were, you were actually able to hit those targets and convert a lot of clients to uh, long-term ARR that wasn't necessarily related to the COVID stuff, uh, which was pretty amazing. So that that was, I think, a huge win for you. Um, so you pivoted 
right? Once once you saw that the the market was going in a certain direction, how did you know when to pivot back? Yeah, that's an that that's a a very good question. Um, so we already knew that some of it didn't have longevity, but the moment was like it it it, it wasn't clear. There's no one who tells you the answer that this is this is as far as you can go in a market and. Um, when the last two, three years, all of your success has been in deploying these types of solutions, your, your instinct is not to move away from it. But uh, again, the, um, I, I guess I truly seek discomfort. When I'm too comfortable, I always get suspicious. And so I rely on experts and people who understand what they're doing. And so what you, you understand is that um, there's people who know stuff and they have better awareness, especially in the medical profession, than you ever can. And so you have to lean on them, have a trusted network that you feel can give you guidance. And so um, the guidance that we we got early coming into 2023 was, and 2023, if I remember correctly, still had Omicron at the very beginning, right? Oh, yeah, uh, I think it was basically done by by the end of 2022. But yeah, yeah. Some years, yeah. Okay, so... Um, oh yeah, you're right. You're correct. Sorry. I'm getting off by years. That's the yeah. pandemic fog. <laughs> but the whole point was as soon as we realized that um, people were saying, even if Omicron has a large wave and it's there, the systems have to go back to normal. And when we realized that was a messaging, we had to create a plan to actually move away from it. And so, um, it, it was about dusting off the old playbook. It was about also assessing the, the healthcare market. And so, to me, it was less to do that I not, less to know that I had to pivot um, into the new population health kind of angle that we're going again, but it was more to understand that that market was not an expanding market. And when you don't have an expanding market as as an operator, there's many things that you can do. You can just become smarter about how you hire, how you expand your business, and make sure that you're more um, that you're realistically looking at what you're able to do, right? Because the market is what feeds your growth, and it should determine how quickly you do that. Um, just because you have a great idea, um, if the market's not ready for it, you're, you're, you're going to end up crashing your company into a mm. wall. So you were really kept your your um, ear to the ground, so to speak, with your with your clients. You were hearing their messaging. And I remember we spoke about this. You know, when when are certain uh, restrictions going to be let up, and how that's going to impact the business, right? Because that's kind of the leading indicator of healthcare going back to normal, right? And you can see it's in the data and all that stuff. But I think what you're saying is the messaging itself was was quite key. How did you, you know, healthcare is a huge industry. You're talking about all of Canada and of course also the US. How did you keep your ear to the ground with such a large and sometimes fractured industry? Yeah. Um, that's where having industry knowledge helps because you understand um you understand what bodies um, determine the actions of the next body to do it. So the the hospitals were listening to the government, and the government was listening to the Ontario Medical Advisory Table, right, for COVID. But behind that, there was also experts who were actually predicting waves that would happen in the future. And so when you go talk to those expert predictions and how they forecasted what a post-Omicron wave would be, it was not that big. And um, and as Canada, because of the Canada's vaccination and stay-at-home policy versus America's one, we actually had a perfect example of what wild COVID would do after there's a certain level of immunity in the community, and that was south of the border. So they, the smart people were doing the analysis. They were demonstrating that the curves were going to start resembling what are in the U.S. And... Um, yeah, that's when we realized, well, look down to the U.S. They're actually a good indicator of six months uh, ahead of us in terms of recovery. So what they're doing six months, uh, 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 what they're doing now is what we're going to be doing in six months. And using that philosophy, that's how we retooled the business. That's fascinating. Um, so how would you assess your leadership during this, this period? You know, a CEO and founder of this startup with dozens and dozens of employees. Um yeah, how would you assess your your leadership uh, and your performance? I'm curious for for everyone to for <laughs> everyone out there in the world that's that's listening to this. Uh, and what would you change if you can change something? Uh, that's a good question. Um, they're all good questions. <laughs> yeah, they they are. It's just yeah. they they make you think. Um, 
well, I hate, I hate self-assessing myself, but let's just factually, how do I assess myself? Is a company uh, intact? Have I preserved uh, value for the people who've trusted us or investors? Yes. So in that sense, are we in a position where we can grow and we can execute on our vision and mandate? Yes. Um, and then the, the one of the most important questions is, did we do right by our employees? Did we protect our employees during a very difficult time in an industry where we were on the front lines? And I felt like we did that responsibly. Um, and we didn't do it excessively, right? Like one of the big things is we realized that hybrid care comes with this cost. You feel disconnected from other employees and everything. We did it uh, with a bit of humanity. And actually we came out of it with a stronger culture, which was really exciting. So, yeah, I guess from that sense, I wouldn't fire myself. But um, uh, in, in terms of things that I would have done better, um, the board is not going to fire you either. Uh, you know, there's a lot of that going on. And yeah, still, yeah. You know, I believe he got reinstated. No, yeah, I just saw the news yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Sam um, Altman opening. I have people are curious. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, but we're not going to, we're not going to do that. Today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's reassuring. <laughs> um, but um, the thing that I would have done differently is um, I would have, I would have actually, focused a little bit more on specific things that were demonstrating traction. And, um, but I think hindsight's twenty twenty. like looking back, it's obvious that certain things weren't good angles to follow. But in that moment, we were all scrambling. We all had too little information. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. I think most of it is just hindsight uh, bias I have that I would have done differently. But there isn't anything that I think was a critical error that me or my exec did, I think. Uh, but ultimately, the judges, the investors, and the employees. Well, you just closed, I don't know if it's public, but you basically just raised a bunch of money from including us and a bunch of other of your, your investors. So I think people are generally pretty happy. Yeah. Happy with how that went. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. A, lot, a, lot, a significantly larger round than you, you first raised from us. So that, that was good. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. You know, self-reflection is always good. I think this this phrase hindsight is twenty twenty is going to mean something completely different now. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a date. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What would you say is um, you know I, I deal with so many founders right in my in my role. Not only people we're looking to invest in and people we advise, but also people we invest in. And mental health in the startup CEO founder, uh, it's. It's a big, it's a, it's an increasingly bigger topic because it's very challenging to run a business. It's very challenging to run a startup that's constantly in seeking of capital and always operating at a loss. And of course, when you're dealing with something significant like a pandemic, that kind of throws something that is stressfully into hyperdrive, especially if you're in healthcare. That's like you're layering <laughs> stress on stress <laughs> on stress, right? How did you maintain a kind of a level head throughout this? whole period and maintained a good, good mental health, assuming you did. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think that I did maintain a general degree of mental health. Um, I think it was hard. It was hard, right? Um, was I immune to everything? Absolutely not. There was highs and lows. And I, I mean, if you're not excitable, if you can't get excited and sad, then um, I'm not sure if you have the qualifications to be an entrepreneur. Um, but I will say this. I will say um, that it really was the team that got me through it, that helped me manage the the the, the stress of it. I I think I am blessed with an, an executive that takes more accountability than they have to. I'm blessed with a team that is um, capable of understanding value and being motivated by it so I don't have to, you know, I just have to give them the opportunity to do good and then they will do amazing things. So if anything, it was what, what really um, diminished the mental health stress. And I mean, like we, I had long, long nights and just never ending weeks, but um, the excitement was we were helping and people were motivated about helping. Um, and the important thing is that executive, when you, when you're in a high growth mode, 
it's funny because your role suddenly changes, right? If you have a great team that's executing and matching opportunity, your job is to get rid of things that make them not be effective at doing the next thing. And so we had an executive that was very good at doing that. We realized that contracting was taking too long, so we streamlined that. We realized that um, our, our support team was was spending hours and hours doing this support into the wee hours of the night because we had a bad process of deploying. So we changed how we develop our product to focus more on internal tools rather than external tools and functionality. And so, um, yeah, if I just to come back to the question, we had an amazing team. We had an amazing team. And I think even though tech by by uh, by founding, I am a sole founder. Uh, I do not feel that way at this point. So. Yeah, right. I know one thing I've been pretty impressed about is the quality of people you've brought around you. Uh, it doesn't always happen that way. And it's amazing when it does. And I think by this point in my career, I think I've dealt with over 30 founder teams, probably more. I haven't really counted it, but at least at least 30 founding <laughs> teams. And um, their ability to hire good people seems to be the make or break because to scale, you obviously need to replicate your own t skills and talents and be more of a air traffic control of talent more so than doing things directly, right? Yeah, yeah. How, do you have any advice for uh, founders when hiring the best people? How to hire the best people? Oh, yeah, that's a that's a very it's a very personal thing, right? Because it's all it all depends on the type of company and how you want to do it. But be clear on what your values and your culture is, because if they're going to join and be that plus, you know, if if they're going to be the plus X on top of your company, not just a plus one, you're going to have to connect in a more real way. And um, this year really reaffirmed that to me, which is that we need to be very clear and loud with our values and what our culture uh, drives, because the people who not only come in and help out, but they actually become a part of the, the overall mission those people become that because they identify with the culture and the value of what you're trying to do. And so it's one of the things, it's a differentiator of a startup, right? Is that if you truly wear your, your, your values on your sleeve, then, then everyone can trust you more because they know that the way that you're going to make decisions are around those values as well. And it's your opportunity. It's kind of like that a little bit of, you know, anti-institutional fight. People are like, they, they, they want to join a startup because it's not how it's done right now inside the industry, right? Mm. If it's how it's done, a blue chip company we can hire you, right? But you need to understand what you do differently and what you're trying to bring into that market that's different than other people. I think that we've been good at doing that and our values have been able to really bring the people closer who, who share them with us and make them empowered people in our company. Yeah, that's, that's quite interesting because one, I remember one of the things I learned in business school, one of the things, business school is important to them. <laughs> This was okay. Um, is that culture comes from the top. Culture, like a company culture, really comes from the top, uh, which was a bit counterintuitive because you think culture is made up of all the people and the top is made up of a few people, right? The executive team at, at most, right? So you would think, well, how can the culture be from the top when it's only a few people? It's really from the bottom. Um, and being involved in several businesses as an investor and as myself, you know, as an operator, I've learned that it's actually quite true. That insight that I learned in business school is very true, that culture does come from the top, right, uh, in most cases. And I've seen that in what you do. You're very mission-driven, right, values-based organization. You have a mission. Obviously, your mission is to make a lot of money for your investors, in addition to all the great healthcare things that you're doing. <laughs> but, you know, there's clearly a mission here outside of just making money, right? And that kind of seeps through everything you do. It's in your material. It's in your messaging. Is how you hire employees, right? I've seen that. I've seen that myself. So that's that's pretty fascinating, and that kind of allows you to expand your team without losing your mission, right? And without losing the focus, because I've I've seen your people have worked crazy hours, <laughs> <laughs> like they're doing that for good pay, but you know maybe they can make more money in other places. But they're very well compensated, of course, so they shouldn't look anywhere else. <laughs> um, but they're working hard, and they're 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 into it, man. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, so I guess the this is something many people struggle with is how to create that kind of culture. And the last three ish years, you've been doing that basically remotely. How do you how do you do that? 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So one of the things we really, uh, one of our, our values is actually to, uh, connection. And um, what, what was nice was we used our awareness of COVID and the, the actual medical um, uh, concepts behind how COVID got spread, both to protect us and to set us free. Right. So one of the things that we realized is it's more dangerous being in a room than it is being outside. And as soon as we realized that, we're like, well, why don't we just meet outside more often? Why don't we set up events? And um, I think that that's that's just a micro example of when you you have culture, everyone knows what you're going to do, which lets people know what ideas are going to be supported and which ones won't. And so, you know, I, I think a company does need leadership, and I do think culture comes from the top. But the way that I look at culture is more looking towards the future. As we grow the company, as it becomes 100, 200, 500 people, the people that are in our company today are going to become cultural ambassadors in that new organization. If I, I, sh I need to invest in understanding and making sure that we have aligned values because they are going to be – these 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 uh, beacons, these lighthouses in the future org. And so that's always been my perspective to how I invest time in them. I'm not investing to talk about culture because it's what I need to do or what I read inside a manual. I'm doing it because very quickly, I am not going to be the one that people hear about culture and what's important and why it's important to do what we do at Verto. It's going to be the people who are everyday employees in our company right now. And when, and it's already happened. Like there's already people in our company, which is just like, I don't see us achieving our goal without that person in that picture. And it's kind of, mm -hmm. um, I think people see that and they understand that. And so my, my energy, I guess, is a little bit more about transparency and being genuine, but there's different ways that you can motivate. Just be clear about what those are and don't be ashamed that that's what brought you guys together, right? There's some great companies that have been motivated about just making revenue because that's what motivates that group. Just be clear on it and make sure that you attract the right people for that mission. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting to bring that up, the revenue part, because I almost found it to be not the case uh, in terms of uh, people being motivated. Uh, money certainly helps a lot, but <laughs> I think mission-driven organizations tend to do better over time, but, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that is more our side. I'm just saying, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to keep an open mind. I hear you. Um, so there's a lot of things going on in the world today, obviously. A lot of founders are struggling not only to raise money, but to, to manage, um, you know, the global conflict. There's a lot of macroeconomic conditions that are um, going against startups, right? Most notably, the fact that VCs are deploying less capital in startup land for a lot of interesting and uh, good and bad reasons. They're raising less money themselves, so that's maybe a primary reason for that. But they're sitting on piles of cash, but they're deploying less. And what would you give, what kind of advice would you give to founders that are struggling right now, uh, not only in terms of raising money, but how they can just persevere through a uh, difficult time? Yeah, um, yeah. Opening up the macroeconomic risk kind of portion of the brain always hurts these days. Let's just be honest with that. Um, I think the strategy that the advice that I would give out to people would be that, you know, money, the value of money, the, the, the flow of money changes with interest rates, with inflation, with, uh, you know, global conditions. But value doesn't change. Value is, uh, is, an, is a fixed concept. If you provide unquestionable value for an industry, and that industry needs that to exist, then you can kind of opt out of the confusing foreign exchange rates and the different volatility of money. Because if you create value, creating true value will bring revenue behind it. It will bring... Uh, you know, earned media, it'll bring word of mouth, it'll bring new clients and it will grow. And so the only thing that's changed in the current market is people aren't going to fund hype or FOMO. They're going to fund value. And so find a way to communicate to investors on the value that you create 
and the reason why that value is needed irrespective of the macroeconomic conditions of the world. And to the last thing is to make sure that you grow your company at the rate that you create value. Just because you get a few contracts that are big, sometimes big contracts don't equate to the value that you create for those contracts. Um, be smart about understanding um, the ones that create true value because customers don't walk away from solutions that create value, but they do walk away from situations that were convenient at a time. Mm. That's, that's a great way to, to, to put that. Uh, creating, you know, macroeconomic conditions change, but value doesn't. That's that's a great way to put that. You know, one of the I, I get reached out to a lot by people that are looking to raise money. Obviously, I think we <laughs> come across thousands of businesses a year. We only speak to a few hundred, uh, and only invest in a few. Right? Yeah. That that's those those are kind of the numbers. And and for any VC that's doing their job, uh, and one of the things that I like to tell founders is that if you're if you have a good company a good business a good team around you you know you're showing evidence that people want what you're doing product market fit whatever that there will be investors that are interested that's that's an, because investors their job is to go find you <laughs> so that that really is kind of like a soul searching thing if they're actually doing that that's something i always like to tell them but clearly you've done that which is why we invested a couple of times now and why we're excited about your journey so, uh, Michael, thank you so much for for speaking with me. Yeah, no problem. This is actually fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's fun for me, too. So, anyways, thanks, everyone, for listening. Michael, is there any, anything uh, you'd like to say before we uh, wrap up? Um, yeah. It doesn't have to be a compliment to me, by the way. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> say whatever you want. Uh, okay, so then I'll speak to the audience. Um, um, yeah, when you see this turmoil, it's easy to get disillusioned, but um, don't forget the chaos equals opportunity right and so um trust me this world is need of good solutions and if uh, you shouldn't be demoralized just because the funding environment isn't easy like it might have been before um all it means is that um think of it a different way if you are truly creating something that the world needs you will differentiate yourself and you will stand out great that's a great message to leave things off on and uh, michael thanks again and uh, hopefully we'll do this um, soon again. Once yes. you become a unicorn and, and all that <laughs> stuff, we'll do this. <laughs> we'll do this again. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.